Hello, uh, and thank you for coming to the uh, South Borough Senior Center for the, uh, for the last of the presentations that I'm doing this year. My name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an elder law attorney. Uh, I work at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, Myrick O'Connell, there are 60 of us, so we pretty much do everything. There are 20 of us right here in Westboro and 40 in uh, Worcester. I do nothing but elder law. Now, as you know from, if you've been to previous presentations, one of the goals, people say, so what do elder law attorneys do exactly? Well, one of the things that we try to do is to make sure that you are aware of all of the programs that might be available to you as seniors in a whole bunch of different situations, whether you're just retired and slowing down or whether you're, at, you're needing hospice because you got, you're really sick or whether you need more care at home, any number of things. So really, I figure my job is to make sure that you're aware of the programs that are available to you. And the purpose of this program is to really talk about your situation, if you're slowing down, you're not thinking that you necessarily need a whole lot of programs, but this is a great time to be knowing who the players are. The last thing you need to be doing is trying to find programs that you might need when it's an emergency and you like need them tomorrow and you're trying to figure it out. So, um, what I, so you, you know my friends, Peter, Paul, or excuse me, Frank and Mary, uh, my couple and their, and their kids, Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. You've all seen them many times. Their goal in life is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. Um, they're going to leave all their assets to each other and then eventually to the kids. They have a house. Um, he's got an IRA. They've got some cash, some an annuity, and they're okay. They're making, their income is um, between the two of them is $2,750 a month. So they're not like fabulously wealthy, but they're making a little under $30,000 a year. Their mortgage is paid as long as they've not got big, big medical expenses, right? They're going to be okay. So the quest, their question then is, so now they're retired, what should they do? Well, the first thing they should do, actually, is they should come and see the senior center and talk to the folks at the, uh, at the Council on Aging. Um, there are some wonderful, you know, this is fully staffed. I was just talking to uh, Cindy Beard, did I get that right? Cindy Beard, who is the outreach coordinator here and has been for like a lot of years, but was talking about when it was just her and the director, you know, about 10, 10 or 15 years ago. And it's really expanded beyond that, and there are some great programs here. So what I asked um, Cindy to do is to just talk to you about both the programs that happen here in the Senior Center uh, and also the things that she does through her outreach work into the community. And one of the reasons I think that's so important, one of the purpose of this program, and this is the reason why we're very appreciative that it gets rebroadcast on South Brook Cable, and Frank and Mary also put it up on their YouTube channel, is to encourage people who haven't been here to come here, right? To get used to the fact that this is really kind, this is your senior center. I mean, that sounds very corny, right? It's always it's your senior center, but it's like your tax dollars at work, and it's the programs that are really designed for you, and the more you can understand those programs, as I say, as you get older, you may never need them. But if you do, you want to know kind of ahead of time that they're there. So uh, could I, if I could introduce Cindy Beard, who's going to talk to you a little bit about the programs that are here um, and also about her outreach efforts. I'm going to ask you if you could to come up here just because it's easier for the camera. And then we're going to introduce you to someone from Bay Path Elder Services who's going to talk to you about a bunch of other programs. Thank you. Well, uh, welcome to the Southboro Senior Center. Um, as you know, we do lots of social, fun, educational things here at the Senior Center. We have exercise programs. Right now there's a cooking demonstration going on. Um, we have exercise groups. We have a book club. We have uh, some adventure club activities. A dull men's group, exciting women's. So, all of those things are in the newsletter, which you get uh, every two months. But what I'm going to talk about and, is... And by the way, that newsletter goes to everybody, right? It's like every senior? As, as long as we have their information, yes. As long yes. as you know. okay. Yeah. So if someone is not getting your newsletter, please let us know and we'll make sure that you do. Um, but what I'm going to talk about are the outreach services. And um, as Arthur mentioned, I've been here a long time. I've been the outreach coordinator since 1998. And um, outreach has kind of changed over the years. But what I help people with is um, how they want to spend their, uh, their senior years. And so if someone is interested in aging in place, 
staying in their home, then that's something that I can help them achieve that goal by connecting them with resources or different services. Um, if someone is interested in downsizing and moving on, that's another thing that I can help them with. Um, so in that regard, uh, if someone, for instance, wants to move on to an assisted living facility, I can help them research what facilities they might want to look at and what different facilities offer. I don't necessarily know because I've been there. I know because I can research, go online, and I can provide you with a list. Um, I have a list of people that will also come in and help you uh, maybe set things aside for an estate sale or help you determine what things you might want to bring with you, help you determine what you want to bring to the transfer station. So there are actually people out there that they have businesses that do these things. Um, for people that are interested in aging in place, there's safety is a, a big concern. So I can't tell you how many people I know their laundry is in the basement. And the idea of a frail, more frail 80, 90 year old bringing that laundry basket down the stairs into the basement is so frightening. But I know a lot of people that do that. <laughs> so. Um, my role is, if someone is amenable to that, is to help brainstorm about how we can do achieve aging in place more safely. Um, and also, people's financial picture changes, and so I might have information or access to different financial pr assistance programs, such as fuel assistance, food stamps, um, the Certainly, uh, there's a lot of overlap here with BayPath, you know, the money management program, which I'm sure you'll talk about more. Um, so as people's financial picture changes, I try, if someone seeks that assistance from me, seeks more information from me, then I'm more than happy to um, tell them about those services as well as do research and look into what else might be available. Um, I just had another thought. Additionally, here in town, there's some tax relief programs as well. So there's the tax work program that you can, uh, you're not volunteering, you're, you're earning uh, money that will go toward paying your property tax. Uh, there's also some other tax relief programs that the town offers. So um, I can give you more information about that if you're interested. There's also veteran services that offers financial assistance if someone is a veteran. Um, so there's a variety of ways that people can stay in their homes more safely, more affordably. Um, I think the name of the game is to just try to be open-minded about accepting help before it becomes a crisis. I always try to remind people that when the crisis hits, if God forbid there's a fall and you require hospitalization or something like that, you may not have as many choices as you would if you were to accept a little help, like maybe have someone come during, from Bay Path or from a home health agency while you're in the shower so that if there's a problem, you've got someone there to help you. That's just an example. So, um, that's also something that I can help provide people with information about is home health um, through Bay Path or through the various home health agencies. There's many of them out there. There's also different individuals that do it informally. And I have a short list of people who don't work through an agency, kind of do it on their own. Um, then Think, last, think back to last winter when we had you know, this incredible amount of snow falling, got lots of phone calls about, oh, I, I can't shovel anymore. How am I gonna remove all this snow? Or am I, a lot of people needing their roofs shoveled off. So I try to keep lists of people that provide those kinds of services. So um, I guess in addition to um, programs that may be available, there's also a lot of information out there, and I just try to act as a resource so that you can access the information that you might be needing. Um, 
I'm not going down the list. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Uh, so. Well, that's, a, that's a good summary. That's a good summary. Okay. I think that's the goal, it, it, to give people a sense that you're really the, the right person to talk to. And whatever I don't have at my fingertips, I'm more than happy to try to research and find that out. I attend meetings with other outreach workers so that we can trade ideas and it's amazing what one of us might know that the others don't. So I try to do that regularly just to keep up on different things that are available or, or other ways that people may have to resolve those issues. I also want to say that I work with adult children or loved ones of seniors. Um, sometimes people come in and say, how can I get my mother to do this or that? And so I try to work with them to adjust their expectations. You know, if someone wasn't a joiner when they were younger, maybe they just love to spend time at home, they're not going to necessarily want to go out and be a joiner in their senior years. People typically don't change. However, they may not know of a way that they could accompany their loved one here to get them interested and to meet other people. So try to brainstorm those options as well. By the way, so. I just want to, I want to give two examples of things that she just said that I think are really important. Most people don't realize, but she would, that there's a program available as a result of a state law and, and, some, and some rules that were passed in Southboro, so that if you're over 62 and you own that home, if you're Frank and Mary, that, and, and if you're having trouble meeting the bills, right, you can defer all of your taxes, all of your real estate taxes, until you die until you die for, for forever and there's no income asset requirement there's no i mean and they would meet this they would meet the income criteria here the, but those programs vary by town by town so i really can't be doing a presentation and telling you the, the, the all of the rules but they'd know locally a second example is the example she gave about assisted living which i think is a great example the reason why if my friends frank and mary never want to leave their house mm -hmm. i bet that's like a lot of people you talk to right but and I always tell people, that's great as long as you're safe there. As long as you're safe there. Because the last thing you want to be doing is getting a broken hip, going to the hospital, and then where are we going? Oh, the nursing home, not good. But remember that Cindy was just talking about um, uh, um, assisted livings, right? Mm -hmm. And about helping you, not even if you've decided that you don't want to go to an assisted living now, right? At least you should know the ones that are around so that if an emergency occurs and you end up in the hospital because something has happened and you're talking to the discharge planner at the hospital whose goal is to get you out the door, right? They don't want you wasting any time in their hospital, right? Mm -hmm. And if, you, if they know, if you know, oh, I want to be discharged to this assisted living and that's safe, they'll do that. If you haven't figured that out, chances are you're getting discharged to a nursing home. So it's a, it, it, and, and she can help you with that stuff. Right. So, or you might yeah. be discharged to home, but with you would have to have homemaking or homemaking and home health services. And sometimes what you might receive may not be enough. So you have to look into options of how you might obtain those. And there certainly are a lot out there. There are a lot. There but a lot. doing yeah. the research before the crisis is key because then you know what you want rather than being faced with a quick decision and not having choices. Right, and so once again, so we're, I'm, we're all old enough to remember back before the internet when you tried to do, let your fingers do the walking <laughs> and you know, figure this out. You can't figure this out through the yellow pages, you know, or even on the internet. It's just a lot of stuff. So really, what, what these folks can offer, and remember, these are your tax dollars at work. They're not charging you, right? is to help you to be the, the, the I want to say the filter through which you're not wasting a lot of time. You know, we can go onto the internet looking for something. You can be there a day and not have figured it out, you know. So to have somebody whose job really is to be looking for this all the time, it's just a big help. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. And, and this is actually a good segue is, uh, um, in, into um, Bay Path El, uh, Elder Services. We have, we have often spoken about Bay Path here, and I've mentioned and I've told you, um, Bay Path Elder Services is the Aging Services Access Point, or ASAP, that services this community and a whole set of communities around here. Uh, and Jane Rourke from Bay Path is here, and she's going to talk to you about a number of their programs. But I just want to mention, as, as um, Cindy was just saying, I'm terrible on names. I got that right, right? Cindy yes, Baird. Yes. 
It's, I'm getting old. I'm, I apologize. It's happening to me. So as Cindy was saying, when you're going home, if you're going home from the hospital, it may be that it's fine to go home, except that you may need some additional services, right? And if you're Frank and Mary, and Frank just had a serious injury and he's going home, maybe Mary is just not up for doing the kind of heavy lifting that it might take to have Frank home. She'd be glad to be there with him and make his meals and do all of this stuff, but there's some other care that Frank might need. So uh, um, Jane's really gonna talk to you about the variety of programs that, that Bay Path administers. They are pretty much the funnel through which all state and federal money goes. So once again, Bay Path Elder Services is not here to sell you anything. They are your tax dollars at work. Jane. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone, it's nice to be here. I've not, not been to this senior center before and it was really a pleasure to see your kitchen out there. Um, so I'm glad to be here. So I do work at Bay Path Elder Services. Um, what we are is one what of the state. Not. <laughs> what we're not, not a college, not we're not the college, <laughs> we're not the high school, um, we're not the main society and, and I have actually when I worked in the information department I did have someone call me to ask if we were affiliated with the main society and could help them get a pet and I was like no but I can give you the phone number. So that's one thing Bay Path we do have an information department um, which is one of the, I, I would say it's like the key point that you want to know about Bay Path is we have an information department you call Bay Path, our number is 508-573-7200, and I can write it down later for you. But give us a call at Bay Path with any questions that you may have. Um, we are funded by the state. Um, we get a lot of state tax dollars to run different programs. Our information department is half funded through the state, half funded through the federal government through AAA Title III money. Um, we are also the area agency on aging, which is we get um, a chunk of money from the federal government that we can grant out to the community. We use some internally in Bay Path. These again, your tax dollars to run really valuable programs. These are the original <laughs> Meals on Wheels people. When that yes. program got created, like, wow, it's 50 years ago almost now, to do Meals on Wheels and start doing stuff for elders. That's, yes. That's, that was when this all started. Right? And we do, again, at Bay Path also we we work with elders, so we do work with elders, but also we work a lot with under 60 individuals in the community. So we have information about programs. We run a few programs for people who are under 60 that may have disabilities of some sort. Um, so anytime you have a, a question about someone disabled or even a senior, you can call Bay Path. It's a good starting point to go for any information. We serve 14 communities in the Metro West. They are, there are 27 ASAPs in the state. So if you have a parent or you had a relative that lives in a different area, you can still call Bay Path. And if you need to go somewhere else, we'll direct you to the right place. But with Bay Path, we do have like a no wrong door. You call us, we'll put you in touch with who you need to be in touch with. Okay, so some of our programs, moving on. Wanna go, Next wanna go slide. There? Yes. Good. So some of the programs, our, our major program is our home care program. Through this program, we get, um, we get funded through the state. It is a program that provides in-home services to people who are age 60 or older. Um, if you're under 60 and you have a, a diagnosed disorder like an Alzheimer's disease or a related dementia, you can also <coughs> possibly qualify. So in this program, if someone needs some help doing their laundry or they need help doing um, bathing, any of those things that would come under the home care, it's a sliding fee scale based on income. There's no asset level. We are not interested in your assets at all. Um, what you would do is with that program, we don't actually provide the care because the uh, state is giving us the money. So it would be a conflict for us to hire the homemakers, but we contract with a number of agencies. We screen them, we vet them. And that's always a concern when you're having an agency going into your home. Um, they're not really regulated by the state. So you could start up an agency and do what you want. Um, but Bay Path has very stringent rules that the state says we have to follow. So all of the people that, all the companies that work for Bay Path, they're all um, very well trained. Any problems you have, you'll have a case manager that will handle the problems. So there's a lot of benefits to, to getting your home care done through Bay Path. And that's one of the most, one of the great things that they do, as, a, as he, she mentions, is they vet everybody. Because it is true, yes. contrary to what you would expect, home care agencies are totally unregulated. 
to be, to be a home care or whatever you want to be, all you have to do is call yourself one and that's it. Right. Exactly. So, so it's, it can be very problematic, you know, so, and, and, and they are the biggest buyer. Baypath is the biggest buyer of home care services in these communities. So they know everybody, right? So they can help you. We can, and, and I actually am a case manager and my part of my role is case manager and, and we do a lot more. So, I mean, if you're just going out on your own, that's fine, but if you want someone there to be guiding you, even if you are high income, even if you make 100,000 a year and you can still get your services through Baypath and get a case manager, you just have to pay a higher amount. And I always think it's, you know, it depends what you want, but it's, you know, you get some extra services there for everyone. So there's essentially any income can qualify for some sort of home care. Um, we also have Meals on Wheels, and I'm sure everyone here has heard of Meals on Wheels. Um, I get a lot of people saying the meals are not good, but then I get people who've tried the meals recently, they're, they're like, these are fabulous. And I actually eat the meals myself. I think the meals are good. You know, they're, we do a good meal. We have all these volunteers that drive it, drive them to the home. Um, and this is just another way to keep you in your home. Just that meal a day, it's some social contact, someone comes to see you, a daily check. And I always say to people, you know, just try the meal. Before, because I get so many people, I'm like, please just try our meal. And they're like, no, I don't like them. I, I mean, but maybe you had it 10 years ago. It's changed. We work really hard to provide a really tasty, nutritious meal. That's our Meals on Wheels. Um, we have a caregiver program. Um, this is a program where we have a caregiver support specialist. Her role is to provide services to people who are providing caregiving. And... Um, Caregiving for someone is probably one of the most stressful things that people need to do. And some people don't have a lot of support. Some people are the sole caregiver. The caregiver support specialist can come out, meet with you in your home. You can come to Bay Path, meet with you in the community. She can provide information on programs and services. She can be someone that you can just talk to, um, someone that can be a support to you. So I, I really always stress that people should look into our caregiver program. It's very helpful. Um, information and referral, I already talked about that. You would call our front desk. You go to the information department. I used to work in information referral, and I had people call me, what's the number for this cab company? And I'd be like, okay, I'll look it up. Here's the number. So we're not really like, we're not really like um, information for general, but if you did call and you said, hey, I need this, it doesn't even need to be related totally to senior care. It could be anything, uh, like what assisted livings are in my area. Um, what nursing homes are there? I want a friendly visitor program. I've had people call me, they'll say, is there a friendly visitor program? So I have a list and I'm like, okay, call your council on aging. And that's where we do work very closely with the council on aging, referring back and forth, especially with the outreach worker. Um, I also mentioned money management because that did come up earlier. This is a program we have volunteers who usually they come from a financial background. And if someone is having issues with writing their checks, sometimes people are um, visually impaired, or maybe they're having some cognitive issues, as long as it's not too severe, or maybe they can't write anymore for some other reason, we do have a money manager that can come out and help with budgeting, bill paying, writing checks, really valuable program. And the volunteers are fabulous. I have people that have had the same volunteer for 20 years, so you build a relationship with your money manager and you know that, you know Baypath is a trusted person to handle your money because you just don't want anyone to be doing that and we have stringent rules with that too. So that's, that's just a few of the programs that we have at Baypath. Can you just, want to, can you just kind of talk about how you, they would connect with Baypath? So okay. if they call and they want to know what's going, what would you do? Yeah, so what you would do, you, you call Baypath. Um, it, okay, 508. Uh, 573. She's testing you to see if you remember. I do remember it. 7200. Zero, zero. So you would, you would call Bay Path. Um, and there is a list there of things that you would need. That list would be if you need some sort of in-home home care services. So you have someone that needs help with laundry, shopping. You would call and say, you know, I need some information about your home care program or I need some information about assisted living in my area. They'll put you through to the information department. You can just ask for the information department off the bat. If you're a new person calling, never called before, I'd ask to speak to information. Um, 
And then you just start with the questions. Very friendly people. We have very well-trained specialists who work at our office. We have three of them, actually. I know all of them, really patient, kind. They'll talk, you, talk with you about your issues. We work to figure out, you know, what can we, what information can we provide with you? If it appears that someone might need some in-home services or a BayPass service, we'll take a referral over the phone and we send someone out to your home to finish that up. So we'll also refer you to another agency if that's appropriate. Um, so that's the process. Just call in, ask for information, and then we'll refer you wherever appropriate. Or if you feel it's necessary, you'll actually have somebody go visit them at their house. Yes, and so if we feel it's necessary, we will have someone come to your home if you might qualify for one of our programs to do an in-home assessment. And also at this point, I think it's a good idea to mention, we do have a program called Options Counseling, and Cindy kind of talked about how she can talk about assisted living. I love the Options Counseling program because um, we have trained specialists who can provide options on where and how to live. So that's basically what they do. They know about in-home services, about assisted living, um, anything that you, how to stay in your home. So the option counselor will actually come out to your house. It's free service, meet with you. They meet a lot with family members. Um, if you had, I mean, I've had them work with a woman as far away as Arizona and they helped her move back to the state. So again, that's free. So if anyone thinks they might have to move or they want to know how to stay in their home, the options counseling would be a, a really good resource and you just call Bay Path and talk to the people in the information. They'll make a referral to options counseling. And I think... Can you just talk just you talk about, about once again? You had talked about home care. I just like yes. you to. I think I don't, I don't want to run people over on time, but That's can fine. you just talk about how much home care you could provide? Okay. Even if even if they don't qualify for the frail elder waiver, even if they're not on Mass Health, how much home care per week do you, could you provide to somebody? Okay. I'll just I'll go a little bit over the program requirement for the home care. You do need to have to you need to have six areas that you need help. So you need to need help with your, and so there, I'll just go quickly through them, like laundry, shopping, and I can give, I can, if you give me your information after, I can mail you out this. Mm -hmm. But basically you need to have six areas. Bay Path needs to provide a critical service like bathing or giving you a meal or having someone do your grocery shopping. So if you do qualify for that, and I've lost my train of thought, I'll get it back. Okay, what can we do? So if you do qualify for the home care, what we can do, our basic program, um, we have a budget of about $350 that we can spend per month on home care for a basic client. That will give you about three and a half hours of in-home service. It could be doing laundry, it could be shopping, bathing, any combination, it could be getting meals. If someone is higher need and they're nursing home eligible, meaning that they can't manage their meds and they, they need help bathing. They're a higher need person. They don't want to go to the nursing home, but they want to stay in their home. That's when BayPath can really provide a high level of service. So we do have an enhanced program. You can get up to eight hours of in-home service under that. And then there's other programs through Mass Health that are quite advanced where you can actually get up to the cost of staying in a nursing home, in, in home care. Like I've had clients that get, I have someone get $60,000 a year of free services sure. to stay in her home. Because it would cost the state a lot more than that to put her in the nursing home. And she gets, you know, all the help she needs. So it, it can be really, um, it really depends on your individual circumstance and also your financial and your asset when you're talking about mass health. And you'll talk about that, I'm sure. Um, but we can, we can provide, you know, it's almost limitless. We can't do, you know, 24-7, but we can do close to that. And, and I, guess, I guess my suggestion would be, you know, regarding those programs, the, 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 the main takeaway from this is don't say no to yourself. Don't say no to yourself. If you, you know, you're Frank and Mary and you want to stay at home and you're trying to figure this out, how you can stay at home, right? You may want to call Cindy to find out about things that are available here or call Baypath and let them come out and try to figure it out for you because that's what they do. Right? And they're not in the business of trying to refuse people. You know, they're not trying to defend. They're in the business of helping you. That's what they're being paid to do. And that's really kind of the, yeah, that's the goal. That's what we do. And we, you know, we work to make sure you're eligible, but we work so hard. You, our BayPath staff are just, I love working at BayPath because of my coworkers. Everyone there is very caring. 
they go out of their way. We want to do, you know, the best we can for each person that, that needs us. And by the way, they're like her. You know, they're in, there they're aren't very like many me. grouchy people, you know, at Bay Path. And so this is wonderful. That you don't go into this work because you're grouchy, you know. Thank you very okay, much. I really appreciate you. it, Jane. But, but, to, but to, give you a to give you a sense, by, I just want to get to the... Um, so, if you, so for example, remember um, Jane was just talking about this program, and you can get home care hours you know, for really a whole variety of things, right? And there's no asset requirement regarding those programs that she was talking about, up to six, maybe six, six or more hours per week that you could get at home. Um, and so if you're Frank and Mary and you've got those assets, it doesn't make any difference. You can still qualify. If you have that income, there is a copay. There is a copay that is required. And there's actually a chart that Baypath uses to figure out what your copay would be. But for Frank and Mary, and remember, Frank and Mary are making about $30,000 a year. Their copay to get all of these services at home is about $100 a month. It's around $100 a month. So you're getting a tremendous bargain, right, by doing this. And once again, don't say no to yourself. Find out. These are, the, you know, this is in begging, right? These are government services that you're paying your taxes in order to be able to avail yourself of if you need it, okay? So, now I'm just going to talk about a couple things if you're, once again, slowing down. What do you need to do in terms of, of, of legal documents? Do you need a will? Probably not, right? You may, you may need a will. Or you may, if you're Frank and Mary and, you're, and your goal is that you want to leave everything to each other when you die, that means you probably are owning all of your assets jointly. If you want to leave everything to your kids after you die, and you don't have a will, well, you know, that's exactly what's going to happen anyway. Because the rules of intestacy, the rules that the state applies to your estate if you die without a will are that if both of you are dead, if one of you is, is dead, the other, the other one gets all the assets. If both of you are dead, your kids divide it up. So it isn't like there's a big deal for having a will. The documents that you do need, you need three things. You need a health care proxy, you need a most form, and you need a power of attorney. And I'll guarantee you, that you know two out of three of those documents and have never heard of a MOLST form. Um, a healthcare proxy, but I'm gonna, so we're going to talk about that for a few minutes. First, a healthcare proxy. You've got to make sure that if you, something happens, if you fall, if you're disabled, if you're at the hospital, that somebody can make medical decisions for you. And that's what the proxy does. And that proxy's word, if the doctor says you can't make the decision, that proxy's word trumps everything else. Even if you've signed a DNR, right, if the do not resuscitate order, if you've signed a MOLST form that we're going to talk about, the proxy can overrule all of that. So you want to have a proxy, right, and you, and, and you want to tell the proxy what you, what you need. Now, I was just talking to someone, because I'm doing some elder law work for her and her mother, who, and, but she is an ICU nurse, right, intensive care unit. And she says, she says she can't tell you the number of times that she has witnessed a healthcare proxy, right, by a person who really couldn't, it wasn't competent to sign one, right, but she's trying to do the guy a favor because he's in the ICU and somebody needs to make his medical decisions and if there's no healthcare proxy, there has to be a guardian appointed, right? Stop the presses, go to probate court, wait a month, spend $10,000. That's because there's not a healthcare proxy. Don't put that nurse or your kids in that position. Make sure that there is a health care proxy so that if you're incapacitated and, and if your husband or wife is incapacitated, that there's a successor. Somebody can do it. This is what you need for a health care proxy. It doesn't have to be notarized. There have to be two witnesses. The proxy can, is empowered to make all medical decisions, uh, um, a, a kind of except uh, getting admitted to a nursing home. Often people, times people will be hesitant about signing a health care proxy because they'll say, I don't want anybody sending me to a nursing home. Well, interestingly, the person with your proxy can't do that. Um, there is a case on this that, it, that if, if you get to a nursing home and the person who is your proxy says, Ma really needs to go to the nursing home, and you say, I don't want to go, the nursing home is not supposed to admit you uh, unless they get a court order admitting you, right? Because as far as this, from this court decision, they said that your refusal to go to the nursing home amounts to a revocation of the proxy. So don't use this nursing home issue as a reason to not do this proxy. You have to have a proxy. Um, you can revoke your proxy at any time. At any time. Uh, I always give this example of this theoretical case. If, you're, if you say you're in the doctor's room, you're in the hospital, and you're there and your daughter or son who is the proxy is there and the doctor is there, 
and the doctor has said you're not capable of making a medical decision and the doctor says I think we ought to operate and your daughter says oh I think we should operate too and you say no right well the fact that you said no even though you're incapable of making that decision revokes the proxy <coughs> revokes the proxy so you can revoke the proxy at any time um, one thing I should mention that you should put in your proxy is regarding organ donations. Most, pe most people don't realize this. People assume that the way that you agree to give organs um, to, um, or to, to contribute organs after you die is by filling in that form at the registry and putting something on your license. And it used to be that that was the case and you can still do it that way. But the law changed a couple of years ago because they were short on donations. And the law now presumes that it's okay to donate your body for tissue or bone or whatever after you die. So that if you don't want that to happen, you want to put that instruction ideally in your healthcare proxy because the person in charge of your remains when you die for purposes of deciding whether there's going to be an organ donation is your proxy. Most people do not know this. So just something to kind of remember. So um, the moles form. The MOLS form it was the expanded version of the do not resuscitate form, right? MOLS is M-O-L-S-T and it stands for Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. Uh, this document uh, now includes a provision that says do not resuscitate me, meaning if my heart has stopped, don't push down through my ribs, probably breaking most of them, so that you can try to push on my heart to see if it will start again. Um, that's something that you may want to have done to you. You should understand that if you are, I think the figure is if you're over 75 and somebody does CPR on you, your chances of surviving more than 30 days are less than 5%, right? Your chances of actually surviving, of actually getting resuscitated are less than 25%. And so what you have done, if, unless you've done one of these forms, um, is that you've decided that there's a very good chance that you're going to die in tremendous pain. Right? So you want to make that decision maybe ahead of time. Right? Um, so the MOLS form also covers things like intubation. Do you want, if your lungs have stopped breathing, someone to push a tube through your throat into your lungs and start pushing air into your lungs to help you start breathing again? Do you want that? Um, one of the most important ones to me is the um, do not hospitalize. Do not hospitalize. My Frank and Mary want to die at home. If they want to die at home, then that means that they want to make sure that when the ambulance shows up because they're on the floor, that they don't go to the hospital because they want it to die at home. Because if you go to the hospital, they will save you. They'll always, they'll just about always save you at the hospital. I remember uh, for many years I was on the board of trustees here at Marlboro Hospital. And, and, and the, at, the, at the monthly meetings, we would go over a bunch of statistics regarding our patients, among other things, how many people died at the hospital. We, don't, we didn't want them to die at the hospital. If a lot of people die at the hospital, now we've got, we've got to report that to the Department of Public Health. All of a sudden, Medicare is coming in to investigate. So if you get to our hospital, we're going to try to do everything we can to save you. So if you want to die at home, you want to say on your MOLS form, do not bring me to the hospital. Now, once again, the MOLS form technically is not a form from you, it's a form from your doctor. It's a set of medical instructions from your doc doctor to the people farther down the food chain, to the EMTs and the nurses and stuff that say, this is what you're supposed to do for this person. And the place you want to keep that form is on your refrigerator. The reason for that is that when the ambulance services are, are trained, their protocol is you walk into a house and someone, and you've got a, this is an emergency, and you know someone's kind of maybe on the floor, look at the refrigerator to see if there's a form. If there isn't, stop looking because you're busy. You've got to do all this other stuff. So if you think this is important, put it on the refrigerator. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the person you've named as your health care proxy can overrule whatever you said on the most form. Well, I've had this situation where the woman has signed the most form and the daughter said, and she was on the floor, the daughter was around because the daughter lived at the house, and the daughter said, oh no, I want her brought to the hospital. She went to the hospital. Because the proxy always rules. So you want to make it clear to your, whoever you're naming as the proxy what you want to be the rules, okay? Um, we talked about that. 
and that's, that's the reason why you want to do this. The alternative is that everything stops and someone has to get a guardian appointed, unless you've got a nurse in the ICU who's willing to lie and say you're competent to sign one of these forms. I mean, it's really, it's really, really important, okay? Uh, the other form that you want is a power of attorney. You want to make sure that if you're incapacitated, someone can sign things for you, right, and handle your legal affairs. For example, um, when it comes to assisted livings or to a nursing home, even somebody with your health care proxy does not have the power to sign the document to admit you to the nursing home or the, or, the, or the assisted living facility. They have to have a power of attorney for that. Now, what does it take to get a power of attorney? Does it have to be notarized? Well, no. Does it have to be witnessed? Well, no. Um, the only time it has to be notarized is if the attorney is being empowered to sign deeds or other documents that would be recorded in the registry of deeds. That said, I always tell people to get their power of attorney notarized. Why is that? Um, you, you, if you've come to these, you've heard me say before, my daughter, who is now a lawyer, once gave me a t-shirt that said, the good lawyer knows the law, the great lawyer knows the judge. Now, in the case of a power of attorney, the judge is like the lady at the bank, right? You know, because your son has gone to the bank and said, I want to sign checks for my mother or my father, and the woman at the bank looks at this document and says, oh, I don't know if this is valid, right? Well, there's something about a notary seal I have found after practicing for almost 40 years. Everybody thinks that makes the document valid. So even though it doesn't in this case, ideally, if you've got a power of attorney, you should get it notarized. Uh, in the power of attorney, if you want to make sure that your children or your spouse can act on your behalf to move assets around, and this is very important in terms of doing a lot of what I do, which involves mass health qualification, the power of attorney needs to say that the attorney can make gifts on your behalf. Otherwise, you may be stuck in that kind of situation. And it also has to say, if the, if the attorney themselves, even if you've named your spouse as your attorney, your spouse cannot take money of yours and give it to herself unless there is a self-dealing clause in the power of attorney that says she can do that. Finally, um, Oftentimes, and I often recommend this for people, you can name more than one person in your power of attorney to act jointly and severally so that either, for example, you can name your spouse and your son or your daughter jointly and severally so that either one of them can act for you. That's different from the proxy where you can only have one person named at any particular time. M many of my clients have found that's very convenient. Uh, and, and the reason for doing the power of attorney is that otherwise you have to go to probate court and get a conservatorship, which is very expensive and uh, just wastes a lot of time and money. Um, many people at this point will say, oh my God, though, what if, you know, Frank and Mary come in and say, what if Mary goes into the nursing home? Don't I have to transfer all of my assets away and wait five years? And the answer is no, you don't. That's not one of the things you have to do because if Mary went to a nursing home, in, given the assets that we've already gone through, she could simply immediately transfer all of her assets to Frank, right? And Frank, as the, while Mary has to show she has less than $2,000 in countable assets, Frank can own his house, own the house, as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000, and can have other cash, cash, or cash equivalents of up to $119,220, and can have infinite assets, and can have infinite income. So if Mary needed nursing home care in this situation, they could simply shift everything to Frank. There's no look back period for that. Frank could go out and buy an annuity, an income stream to, uh, to replace some of his assets and Mary could immediately qualify for mass health. And I say that just because many people are under this, this myth that the only way that they can protect themselves against this situation is by transferring things out of their names uh, and waiting five years and that's not true. Um, so we already talked about that. Um, we've talked about that briefly, and I'm not going to do that. Uh, I just want to mention one other thing. Bef if you're getting older and you're slowing down, but while you're still able to do it, you may want to consider getting a small long-term care insurance policy. Or if you, if you are older and have an old long-term care insurance policy that you thought was useless because nursing homes cost $400 a day and the policy only pays $50 a day, well, guess what? If you wanted to say, if you were Frank and Mary and one of your big issues is you want to make sure that when you die, your kids get your house or at least get the ability to sell the house and divide up the money because that's your big asset. And if you have a, a, a long-term care insurance policy dated before March 15, 1999, and if that policy will pay at least $50 a day for two years, at least according to the face of the policy, 
And if you haven't used up the policy and you go to the nursing home, you have at least one day left on the policy, um, your house is safe. MassHealth won't count it, MassHealth won't lien it, there'll be no claim against the house if you've qualified for MassHealth and MassHealth has paid for your nursing home care. Now, you're saying to yourself, but what if, that's a long time ago, what if I bought a policy after that? Well, in that case, if it's after that, then your house is still safe as long as the policy called for payments of at least $125 a day for two years. And as long as you haven't used up all of the policy. The reason why I say that is many of these policies have a home care proviso that says you can use the benefit for the nursing home or for home care. And many people want to use it for the home care so they can stay at home. And so all I'm saying is if you've got one of these policies and it's got 730 days worth of coverage, make sure you save one day. You can use all 729 days for home care, but don't use that last day. And then when you go to the nursing home, as long as you still have that policy, that policy is going to protect your house. It's not going to get leaned. It's not going to have to get sold. It's an interest, this is an, it's an interesting piece of trivia. Um, I want to mention one other thing. Uh, the, oh, and, and if you, if you in, in wanted to see this presentation again, um, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, and you can just Google that and watch this show again. And thank you very much to Southbrook Cable for being willing to, to, to repeat these. One interesting brand new thing happened um, with um, the entity that controls Medicare and Medicaid like two weeks ago. And they said that one of the issues with doing this MOLST form, you know, and having your doctor go through these issues with you and having them sign it, is that um, Medicare would not pay for the doctor's visit. Right? When you go to see the doctor, probably with your son or your daughter or your spouse and say, you know, I want to be considering how I'm going to deal with these issues, wh whether it's a DNR or intubation or, or, or going to the hospital. Well, CMS just changed that rule. CMS is the, the federal agency that governs Medicare and Medicaid. And as of January 1st, if you make an appointment with your doctor to have those discussions, your doctor can get paid for that visit, which is a big deal if you're the doctor. <coughs> Right? Because as you know, I mean, these doctors are trying to schedule, they're, they're, they're a general you know, primary care doctor. They're busy and they're trying to schedule things pretty you know, tight. So you have the ability now, if you want to really think this out, um, to sit down with your, you know, with your spouse or with one of your kids and go to the doctor and have them talk to you about these options and make some decisions before it's an emergency. So, that's it. Thank you very, very much. Um, any questions from anybody who is here? Could I ask for a quick round of applause for my guest speakers from today? Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you all. And if I don't see you, have a wonderful holiday. We'll see you next year in 2016. Oh, my God. Thank you.